sure she tells my, tells my wife who she is. This evening, we have two of the most knowledgeable and articulate men in our country on the, to address this issue. And we are fortunate indeed to have both of them with us. I think it is really an abundance of riches. Um, Rear Admiral Eugene R. Carroll, U.S. Navy, retired, was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral in 1972. I'm just going to give you the highlights of a very rich and interesting career. Um, he served on General Alexander Haig's staff in Europe from 1977 to 79, and his last assignment on active duty was in the Pentagon as Assistant Deputy Chief of Naval, Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operations. In this capacity, he was engaged in U.S. Naval planning for conventional and nuclear war. He is a much decorated officer for his service in World War II, in Korea and Vietnam. A graduate of both the U.S. Navy and U.S. Army War Colleges, Admiral Carroll holds a B.A. and M.A. degree in international relations from George Washington University. He is now serving as deputy director of the private, non-governmental Center for Defense Information in Washington, D.C. He is actively engaged in research and analysis concerning major defense issues and is writing and speaking on the need for rational military programs which will meet the long-term needs for national security interests of the United States. It is my privilege to introduce Admiral Eugene Carroll. Good evening, and thank you for the warm welcome and the wonderful turnout. How many of you are confident that you really understand the difference between a kiloton and a megaton? <laughs> I mean, the, the language of nuclear warfare and of the nuclear relationship of the United States and the Soviet Union is arcane, abstract, confusing, deliberately so. They want to create as much confusion and, and lack of confidence among the public at large as possible and say, just leave it to the experts. We'll take care of it. We'll protect you from those evil Russians and, and we'll have enough megatons to do it or enough strategic weapons or enough this or that. Let's not deal in those sort of facts tonight. I could give you a data block if that's what you need, and I don't think you need data block. Let's talk instead in common sense terms, plain language, about what's going on. What's really happening today? And then what are the prospects for some change or improvement in the situation in the future? And I'd like to do it in terms of what I call thunder at Reykjavik, a living drama in three acts. Congressman Downey chairs the House Budget Committee's Task Force on Defense and International Affairs. He has written extensively on arms and arms control for the most prestigious newspapers and magazines. In 1978, he served as a congressional observer to the SALT II negotiations. In 1985, he was appointed a congressional observer to the START talks in Geneva. In addition to his committee assignments, which include Ways and Means, Budget, Select Committee on Aging, Congressman Downey is Vice President of Parliamentarians for Global Action, Chairman of the Congressional Arts Caucus, Co-Chair of the Congressional Monitoring Group on Southern Africa, Member of the Congressional Caucus for Women, Member Arms Control and Foreign Policy Caucus, and a member of the Democratic Study Group. I am honored to introduce Congressman Tom Downey. Thank you, Shirley. And uh, let me tell you what, uh, how exciting it is to see so many of you. Um, I have uh, the beginnings of feeling, Admiral Carroll, that uh, I haven't had since uh, 1982 when we uh, 
met in New York City, all 700,000 of us, and managed to uh, start something very exciting. And I think that... Um, I think we are, as a people, and uh, you are far ahead of us in the Congress than, than we are in the Congress in thinking about these issues. Uh, I often tell my colleagues who worry about these votes on arms control, well, go back and have a town meeting and ask how many people think that it's a really good idea to keep testing nuclear weapons uh, or to uh, put weapons up in outer space. Because if you take the time to explain to people the facts, you will find that they are amazingly more enlightened than sometimes we give them credit for. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, Act Two before I get to Act Three. Every Wednesday morning for the last year in my office at 8.30, all of the members of the House who are interested in arms control, Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy and Friends of the Earth and a whole variety of other groups, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, meet in my office to try and plan what our legis legislative strategy would be in the House of Representatives for that year. We planned for a year to point to a period of three days that occurred, we knew first in July, and that would occur later on in October. The strategy would be to try and win a couple of important votes on arms control, to stop testing nuclear weapons and to join the Soviet Union in their moratorium to send a signal to the world that we were prepared to not see the development of more nuclear weapon systems, to live up to our treaty commitments in the Non-Proliferation Act, to try and reduce the number of members of the Nuclear Weapons Club. Testing was to be our priority. And the reason it was, was because we controlled the money. As Admiral Carroll mentioned, we've tested some 830 times since 1945 and are way ahead of the Soviet Union in both warhead design, reliability, and effectiveness. And we knew that we, with your help, the grassroots organizing, that we could maybe take the money away from this administration and match the Soviet moratorium. The other thing that we wanted to do made eminent sense was to keep the structure of arms control the SALT II agreement and the ABM treaty in place, at least during the rest of these dark years until 1988 or 1989, when we felt there might be an administration that would be more interested in arms control. Good evening. It's wonderful to see all of you here this evening. Now, this is the part of the program where you get to participate. I'm sure after listening to our two speakers, you have lots of questions. And now is the time to ask them. So I'm going to start right now. Questions, please. Lady in the front. Uh, I, I read uh, after Reykjavik uh, that several people had come out and said that no way could we do away with nuclear testing because we were behind the Soviets in conventional weapons and so forth. Uh, I mean, I thought that was the most ridiculous uh, reason for it. But I'd like to hear somebody say something about that. Isn't this whole thing ridiculous? Well, please don't be misguided or uh, in any way deterred by people who say, well, you know, you've got to worry about this conventional, that at the end of 10 years, somehow we're just going to do away with all our nuclear weapons or just one group of them and leave the Soviets with a vast conventional superiority. Many, many things will happen in the interim, including the question of reduction of conventional weapons, which would go hand in hand with any agreement to reduce uh, nuclear weapons as well and should. Let me add one very important point on that question, because it's central to the debate that's going to go on. We can't give up nuclear weapons because then we'll be defenseless to the Soviet's conventional power. That is a deliberate misrepresentation of the actual facts and is propounded to create fear so that you'll support $312 billion for national military programs. Don't call it national defense. The myth of Soviet superiority is exactly that. I'll give you one good quote. General Frederick Croson, who commanded the NATO Central Front in 1983 and commanded all the U.S. Army forces in Europe, said, it always distresses me to hear this talk about our defense 
ruthless uh, situation in Europe. I can do a very good job of defending my, my uh, sector with the forces I have, and I've never asked for any more. Two months later, the army retired him involuntarily over his violent protests. I mean, he just wasn't with the party line saying, look, we're not defenseless to the Russians. We ha haven't been. Let me ask you a question. Who has more people in uniform, NATO or the Warsaw Pact? NATO. Of course NATO does, sure. Who spends more money on military programs? NATO. Who has a better technology? NATO, so on and so on and so on. If NATO can't defend itself with the forces, with the money, with the, the strong alliance that it represents against that weak, unstable Warsaw Pact, then we better just fold it up and give in because we're pretty dumb people. Gentlemen, right over there. For <coughs> Admiral Carroll, I'd like to ask what you consider to be the Soviet agenda and the motivation behind it. Real good question, and Congressman Downey can undoubtedly give you some good information from his point of view. There has been a f formal change in Soviet priorities with the uh, advent of Mr. Gorbachev. He has, to a degree, never seen in, in the Soviet hierarchy espoused the needs of the Soviet people and the needs the need to increase their quality of life in the Soviet Union over and above everything else they're doing. I mean, he has set his course on that priority. He's going to improve the quality of life in the Soviet Union. Obviously, in order to do this, he must relax the burden of the arms race. There's, you know, that's where something like 15% of all of their resources go to keep up with the United States of America, essentially. So he wants arms control agreements. He wants a reduction of the competition in space, first and foremost, because that's the most expensive. And then he wants, and I believe is very sincere, a series of agreements to reduce the nuclear arms on Earth, then conventional arms. He really wants to reduce the burden of the military competition so he can get on with improving the quality of life in the Soviet Union. I don't know that he's absolutely sincere or that negotiating with him on these points would be easy, but I know that it's irresponsible not to seize the opportunity that seems to exist and to enter into thoughtful, constructive negotiations looking for those accommodations of mutual benefit to both our societies. Gentlemen, right there. Uh, some time ago, we had a program with uh, Professor Melman about the uh, conversion of the military economy into the peace economy. That was some time ago. I wonder why everybody talk about those awful things. I was bombed in Dresden. 136,000 people died around me. I was refugee at that time. And I'm very moved now. <laughs> I'm falling again. Why nobody talked about uh, how much our government spent for the peace? Why well, uh, Mrs. Romain did uh, uh, call and uh, ask her if uh, we are spending too much for defense. Uh, why don't we ask how much we spend for peace? Uh, uh, every fourth Long Island uh, makes a living on the defense, right? So-called defense. Now, uh, how many uh, committees Congress have to uh, tell us that our Congress has a plan for the conversion uh, of peace? that the Soviet Union and the United States are changing our economy, that we wouldn't stop when the war economy disappeared. I asked my son in California a week ago, I said, Matt, are you for peace? Dad, I said, how do I make my living? He <laughs> <laughs> was for the end of it. Well, let, let me, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to do justice to your question, but let me try for a minute to simply say that Conversion is important and a good idea and something we should do. But uh, in the process, it, it almost presupposes that the reason why we are in this precarious state is because we have to feed a war machine. It's dangerous and it's expensive, and, and all of that is true. But more fundamentally, there are some the attitude changes that have to occur first in our country. One, a recognition that uh, a sense of collective security is the way to achieve meaningful peace with the Soviet Union. Then the process of conversion 
could commence. I had a, a, a fascinating discussion with one of my friends who works uh, for one of the defense contractors. He's a pretty important official there. They never felt happier than when they worked on the space program. Uh, and uh, there are meaningful things that we can do for the peaceful exploration of space. Use many of these same scientists. There are many other needs here on Earth to keep all thousands of Long Islanders employed in more peaceful means and in high-tech ways as well. But before we get to that question, we've got to also get on with the notion of a collective security. And then that, in part, requires a level of education that is beginning now in our schools and a commitment from our government as well for things like the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which has been uh, treated abominably by its current uh, director, and the other agencies of government that are designed to, to foster a more creative look at uh, relations with other societies, which we just haven't done, and in this administration has received short shrift. This will be the last question.